name is Kerry Ann Bradley, if you want to know my last name as well. And um, my business, which is has a presence on here, is called Pilates at Your Desk. I've got, mm -hmm. um, a, that's like my brand for working, well, teaching movements you can do while you're at your desk. <laughs> yes. And then um, se separate to that, I have my um, more sort of traditional Pilates. I say traditional, but I mean more like mat and reformer yes. and all the rest of it. Um, um, brand, which is, is probably... Just well, I call it Pilates with K A because it's quite long to say carry on. So, but yeah, the brand is Pilates at your desk, and then I've got all my other stuff that sits over here. <laughs> yes. Now, when you said applies at your desk initially, I thought like corporate desk and you know like your kind of you know desk wear type thing. But then you said you're in a school, so I didn't even think like students and that sort of thing too. Like, is there a specific audience that you're trying to capture? Um, so it started off being quite corporate. I used to work um, at a desk for about a decade before I did Pilates. Um, so it did start being quite corporate. And I've been running Pilates at your desk for about four years now. And uh, it's kind of, I, I'm going across all different industries now. So I've started in the last year Pilates at your school desk or move at your school desk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I, I've worked with breweries. I've worked with um, NHS teams, I work with radiographers within that, nurses, um, hairdressers, uh, just teaching them how, so I sort of think more about how to move when you're not moving, <laughs> if that yes. makes sense. Yeah, 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 absolutely. How to move when you're not moving. Okay. Yeah. Say more about that. So I think through, well, you can tell me what you think about this, Martin, but mm -hmm. I think, what, you know, when we go back to our school days and we're sat on uh, the carpet, we're in the UK, you sit on the carpet at the beginning of the day. Do you yes. do that? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so <laughs> you start your day on the carpet and if you move around and fidget, you kind of, you get told off for doing it because yes, it's, it's quite so. distracting. Absolutely. And I wonder if you go right back to the roots, maybe... Maybe, you, maybe that's where we start to get this idea that when we're working, we don't move, we stay still, or we're in yes. set positions. And then right. you compartmentalize, you're working and you're being still with your on the sports field or out and about moving. And so I think we, subconsciously we start to forget that, um, or maybe on a conscious level too, we, we, we ignore the fact perhaps that we, we can also move when we're not outside doing allocating a set amount of time to yes. exercise i keep doing this at the moment <laughs> um <laughs> gotcha. and so i just i guess yeah. where i'm going with that is when you're not moving i.e mm -hmm. on the carpet listening yes. to the seat or whatever it is um that you're trying to then think of ways that breaking down those barriers and then bringing in movement into those scenarios if that makes sense gotcha. yeah absolutely it's so funny i have this flash with my brother in the chat here uh, we used to get in trouble for dancing at the ki at the kitchen table, like when we're eating dinner, we're like sit still and finish your food. So sort of, you know, we'd kind of be bopping to the music, and it's just like the sense of like, yes, you're supposed to be still right now, so don't move. And you're saying, well, no, there are ways that we can integrate movement into our everyday life, not just when we're supposed to be moving. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I, I, I notice it with my daughter, like she'll get up and I'll say, sit down, <laughs> eat your dinner. Maybe not in such a mean way, but that's just right. for illustrative purposes. Depends on the day. And, then, <laughs> yes. um, and, and, um, and, so, and so I catch myself saying, or even though I'm telling, try, trying to change the narrative with people, I catch myself all the time saying, stay yes. still, stop moving. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, and I guess, there's a, I guess there is a line between where, where it's movement, where it's distracting you because it's in your face boundary <laughs> invading, or right. um, just trying to find small ways to move, maybe like sit, squeeze your sit bones or just moving a bit side to side or little shoulders, you know, just to right. remind your brain that you do have that ability to do that when, when you're working as well, I suppose. Right. Yes. Now my kids are promoted out of protest of my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why I do as well. Yeah, yeah, for real. So that saying, so are you basically running with the saying like sitting is a new smoking? Like that sense of like this is this can be a killer if we're if we live this inactive life. Like, do you kind of play into that a bit? Or well, I try. I personally, I try to stay away from that kind of um, language actually because mm -hmm. 
I try to flip it and make it maybe a bit more positive than that. So to say, you know, if you move more, then you're yeah. going to feel X, Y, and Z, rather than if you sit, you're going to die. Because actually <laughs> that can, that's just, it's quite, I get why, why the message is that, but I also think yeah. that it makes people feel really bad about themselves. And I, I honestly, I, I speak to so many people and they tell me, I'm awful because I sit and I don't get up from my desk for eight hours. My posture is awful. This is awful. And I, and I look at them and I think, you're not awful. <laughs> you're fine. Yeah. Just got to wiggle right. about a bit more or, you know, do some of these right. things. And yeah. So, so I try, I don't know, I think maybe in some ways not using such uh, sort of strong language can act against yeah. you in a way because maybe it then... Um, dilutes your message or makes you seem a bit l like less committed to it um, yes. but I, I, that's a risk that I'm willing to take I suppose yeah I, no I hear you on that because like, that's, that's like sales 101 right you speak to people's pain right yeah exactly yeah that's like yeah. that's traditionally we've been taught you speak to the pain so if you sit still you're you're gonna have a degenerative spine and you're going to die in five years like sort of thing yeah. like, oh no I better start exercising yeah, and you're you're flipping the script and, and like like we say in Pilates, you're queuing to the positive instead of queuing to the negative, right? Exactly, um, and it's a harder sell. So mm -hmm. going back to your sales comment, it is a harder sell. But I guess the more we're saying it on mass, the more volume, the higher the volume, and the more yes. normalised it becomes. And yes. So just trying to change change how as a collective we think about movement. Yeah, so I see the comment here from Beach Pilates. Thanks for jumping in. I know you have to get going there. Um, yeah, watch the replay later and just hear all the brilliant stuff that Kiri is going to say later. Um, Phil, do you ever uh, use rolling chairs in your desk Pilates practice? What's a rolling chair? We have um, the, I'm thinking, is he, you know the stability ball chairs? Uh, um, oh, yeah, so it's like the structure of a chair with a, with a big ball in the middle of it. Right. Yeah, so um, personally, I, I sit on a stool, but um, I do have clients that sit on stability balls, and they really like them. I guess when you're sat on a stability ball, it's much easier to, well, it's so you're not wobbling around all over the place. You're more likely yeah. to sit up on your sit bones, the bones underneath your pelvis, I'm sure. You want to, uh, well, I know you know, but... <laughs> and then, um, and also, I guess that creates a bit more of a stability challenge. So it's getting you to work even when, move when you're not moving. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. So then if you, you start up a corporate and then you work to like, you know, at your, at your school desk type thing, um, do you have a favorite client that you worked with? Like one that you enjoy most in terms of bringing your brand to them? Oh, that's a, that's a true. It's an interesting question. Um, I, I think, do you know what, I don't have a favourite type of organisation mm -hmm. to work with or, or, or individual uh, because I quite like the range. I quite like uh, the challenge of trying to yep. find new ways to, to work with different people. So, mm -hmm. so keeping it fresh almost and, um, yeah, that, that's something that I really like. So I love sure. it when I get a new, a, a new challenge. <laughs> yes. No, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, like, I think... How about I, you? I like that. Yeah, that's. I was gonna say, like, I mean, for me, I, I like those new challenges, and because it 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 commits me to learning something new, right? If someone says I have this condition, or I played this, I someone walks in and say I am a water polo national player. I'm like, I've never played water polo in my life. Now I got to research what they yeah. need, what the needs of that sport are, how I can help them, whatever it is. So like I, that excites me. Um, but my, like my favorite people to work with is, is men. Like I love working with, with gentlemen who work out all the time and have never heard of Pilates, um, you know, athletes who are at a great level or someone who is just like a, like a desk warrior who just wants to still keep up with their kids and, and, you know, play, you know, beat their buddies in shinny hockey on the weekends and stuff like that. So like, those are the people that excite me the most. So sometimes I phrase the same question this way. So like, who would you train for free? If someone came in and you just yeah. love, love, love working with them, like I can train you for free the rest of my life just because it's just a joy for me. Yeah. Like so who I is do, that person look like? Well, I do work with some people um, for free. Um, and generally, so I, I put the Pilates at your desk stuff to one side. Sure. Uh, I do a lot of rehab work. So working mm -hmm. with people, lots of different ongoing medical conditions, um, 
or injuries. And sometimes I will work for, with people for free in that capacity on like an affordability basis, mostly. Yeah. Um, and I, but I would do that for that cohort of clients because uh, I really like working with people who mm -hmm. um, benefit from Pilates uh, in a, from a, a pain perspective, if that makes sense. No, a positive. <laughs> yeah. 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 I like to hurt Not people with my Pilates. <laughs> yes. And you're going to die if you sit too long, right? Like, no, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, Exhale Pilates London, how are you? Hello! <laughs> and Victor, all of our people are showing up. Um, yeah, no, so that, that's fun. So what made you decide to, to go in that direction? And, and the reason why I asked that is because like we have, we have Pilates, but then everyone kind of has a niche within this niche, so to speak. Yeah. Right? So... So there are a couple of things there. So when I worked at a desk, I literally had like a shopping list of different desk related aches and pains. I used to sit, I'll just go back a bit so you can see. So I don't have to describe. Oh, can you see me there? No, you can't. Yes. Anyway, yeah, again, a bit like yeah. a, a cross between a cross on, so really rounded like this, and then my legs like wrapped around like a pretzel. So <laughs> for hours on end, you know, and I was really wow. trained to my desk, some days yeah. like 12 hours, whatever, 14 hours. Um, and I had sciatica, knee stuff going on, neck, shoulders, all the rest of it. So there was why. that in the background, <laughs> you know. <Yeah. laughs> this was like <laughs> wandering yeah. through space um, between bars at the time. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, um, so I, um, so there was that in the background, and then uh, when I started working with clients, a, a lot of my work was one to one, actually, and I would. Someone would come, we'd do our lesson, it was always amazing. We were like, yeah, I feel good. And then they come back next week and they're like, oh, you know, I've got this, I've got that. And I was just like, oh, yeah. this is really frustrating. So I just put together a program of movement, simple stuff that mm -hmm. they could do at their desks. And then those yes. who did it were like, yeah, I feel good all the time. Those who yeah. did it were like, ooh, I need to keep coming back every week. And so right. I thought, right, okay, there's something in this, I'm just going to make this a thing. <laughs> Yeah, so I did. but it's, it's it's so funny though. Like, if you're like perfectly honest, so like, you almost and it sounds like a little bit because I know I do this sometimes. It's like I did that almost more for me than for them because it was so frustrating to be at the exact same point with them week over week. When if they just did a few things in the middle of the week, then we could progress the next time we meet. Exactly. Yeah, there's definitely an element of that, and um, yeah. I, I think that's also why I'm such an oversharer as well because <laughs> constantly getting in like you know comments or emails yes. or people coming and they're like oh I've got this I've got this and then I'm just like okay if you do this every day so simple stuff like stand in your heels more or stand more on your right foot or you know really simple stuff um mm -hmm. And then, and then they do it and then they can see the benefits of it. And then I'm like, okay, that's much easier for me because now we're working with something yes. that isn't always focusing on the imbalance wherever it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. So, so that, that I, I hear what you're saying in that context of, of, of oversharing in the sense that like, those are the things you should be selling. Those are the things that you should be roping them into the studio, getting to pay for your hour and for your knowledge and stuff. But the paradox is that when you do it like that, they refer people to you. They keep coming yeah. back, right? Yeah. And we, I used to talk about that a lot in the personal training world where you, you train your client in a way that they don't need you and then they keep coming back even though you've given them the tools so that they don't have to come back. Yeah. I, and that, that's, a, I mean, I guess there's a few things going on there, isn't there? Part of it is because they trust you and they know yeah. that when they're in your... I guess in your in the space with you that you're going to be making sure that all the things that have been helped before are still in good order so it's like a, a reassurance I suppose yeah right. uh, and just because it, it's it's a um it's an accountability thing as well I guess it's you know yes. going to my lesson every Monday at 11 or whatever <laughs> there is right so I'm yeah. doing the star and if I do this other stuff in between I'm gonna feel better but at least I've got that um goalpost every week that's, yes 
Yeah. For sure. Yeah, that, that accountability piece is huge for people. Yeah. Um, we, I think we, that's another line we used to say all the time is that it's, it's either education, motivation, or accountability. Those are the three reasons why people come to you. You know, and they may know it all, but they're not motivated to do it. Or they they know it all and they're motivated, but they just need someone to just touch base with them. Or they have, you know what I mean? Like there's some yeah, one of those three that like it, ha- it flows in a certain way. And there's always one element that they're, they're pulling. You know, I think there must be part. a nice diagram in there somewhere. Yeah. Like, isn't it the, the Venn diagram? <laughs> yeah, almost a Venn diagram. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, thinking. This, yeah. There you go. You can put it in your next book. Ah. <laughs> I'm not sure there will be a next one. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's discuss. So like so like is it was it that hard to do it? Or was like what was it was it about the book itself that you're like yeah. So um, yeah, it was really time consuming. I did it in a short space of time actually. So I was commissioned okay. to do it. Again, I won't be able to remember the dates, but I wrote it in about four months, I think, and that was wow. I was during lockdown I was really busy so I was working teaching not not this teaching (laughs) about 40 hours a week and then writing that in between sessions yes homeschooling all the rest of it so it was really intense actually (laughs) (laughs) and it it was yeah it was really hard and I look, I look back on last summer when I... Yeah, I'm saying I'm just laughing because, like, you can see that you're totally, like, no, this is, like, really hard. Like, this wasn't just, like, wow, this is difficult. Like, this is, like, really hard. It was really hard. And I look <laughs> yes. back on last summer and I think... Yes. I didn't see last summer. I was literally just write, writing, teaching, <laughs> doing, being, trying to be a good mom at the same time. And it was, it was really intense and... I, you know, then I had to read it a lot, like, because I, I like, the, I like to make sure everything's <laughs> as I like yeah. it to be. So I had to read it, read it, read it, read it, and then I was just like, I don't want to read this so anymore. Funny. So, are you like in therapy for writing your book right now, or like, what's going on? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> wow. that's another story. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's that's real talk, though. Right? I mean, a lot of times we think, "Oh, so sexy! I got this idea. I'm gonna write a book, and I'll be famous for my book." It's like, I like I can tell you, everybody, I wrote a chapter in a book. Like, I, I was asked to write a chapter on a book, in a book, this leadership book, and I remember like working a twelve hour day getting home at 10.30, realizing I didn't see an email that said, please review and edit this because it's going yeah. out tomorrow and send it back by midnight. And thinking to myself, like, I can't stay up. Like, you know what I mean? And have to get it out. I remember, like, just deadlines and stuff. And that was just a chapter. Yeah. Like, that's, like, not even big time. Like, people write books and, like, and they struggle. And I'm like, I, a chapter? And you want me to do more? Yeah. I'd like to, but... but... Well, I don't know, because I think maybe um, maybe you're doing yourself a, a discredit there, because actually I wonder if the more, it, does, it's not, it might, might not be a proportional um, increase with the amount that you do, because once you're in it, you're in it, right? Yeah. And if you're yeah, just writing true. a chapter in a book, you want it to be really good, because you are pre- giving something to someone else. You're contributing to someone else's work. So you've probably yes. got that added pressure as well. But yes. I hear what you're saying. But I just yeah. that is a lot of work. <laughs> to have True. get in at half ten and say it needs to be there by twelve, that's intense. <laughs> that's it's intense. It's intense. And there's yeah. boundaries too, right? Like and we were talking offline about boundaries too. Like, I mean, I'm sure I could have done a better job of balancing my life so I wasn't like staring at deadlines the whole time. But yeah. yes. It, yeah, there, there's definitely a trade-off, um, and there was in this period, and there is again because now it's going to be published in just under two weeks, so there's stuff around that. Um, and it's it's not just like the, the writing or it's thinking about it. It's like, oh my God, how is this gonna go? Like, is everyone gonna hate it? Are the people who pick it up gonna think, oh, this isn't useful? You know, all this mm. sort of inner saboteur. I go like, it's <laughs> like, arr, arr, arr. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. And then you're like, okay, it's fine. It's, that, it's good, it's good, don't worry. No, it's not good, it's good, no, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Self-talk. Oh, oh it's, yeah, uh, it's right there. I'm looking at it. I, I put it next to me so that I, because I, I think I'm 
kind of move, I do something and then I move on from it. So I never actually appreciate, like the, I'd never say, oh, you, that's good. You've done a good job because I'm on to the yes. next thing. So with this, I put it, yeah, so I, I put it next to me on my desk or wherever I am, I take it around. <laughs> so Good. I can look at it and remind myself, you did that, you know? So, cause otherwise I'm like, what am I gonna do next? PhD, ready. <laughs> right. So it's like, it's, yeah. So savoring those moments. Yeah. Like just like pausing and just being still enough to savor that moment. That's key. That's tricky. <laughs> yeah, it is tricky. It is tricky. And then also, I mean, you mentioned, you just touched on it quickly too. I mean, you're already working these jobs and then you're trying to be a mom and then you're trying to get this this book and you're all these little spare moments. Like, yeah, that's, that sounds like it was just, it's quite the challenge to just find that, that, that balance. Definitely. It's really hard to find the balance. And then I suppose as well, like you will uh, know yourself, if you then throw in all the other stuff that isn't the teaching time, isn't the writing time in, in the case of writing this book, it's the, the marketing, the replying to the emails, the sales, yes. all that stuff. And you can just get so sucked into it all, I, I suppose. And because um, part, I guess the, one of the reasons why social media works is because you are bringing your, your, your bringing your business life um to everyone but you're kind of you're not it's not just your business life because you're you're yourself when you're doing it so then it gets all yes. mu murky and muddled up so you're like a business but you're yourself and then there's yes. again that that makes it difficult to create space and boundaries around that i guess mm -hmm. i think i was waffling a bit there did that make sense it did <laughs> oh so, <good. laughs> so how, how did you reconcile that for yourself well, that's something I'm working on, Martin. Perhaps you could. You... <laughs> I think we're all Maybe. working on it. That's why I'm trying to take notes for myself too, right? Like, I mean, like, oh, okay. Oh, yes. I, I, one thing I do do, and I'm very, I try to be very diligent about this, is that I put, I turn my phone off after my last lesson, and it, that changes every day. But at least, like, for an hour, an hour and a half before I go to sleep, I don't look at my phone. Yes. Um, and I think, I mean maybe everybody does that and I'm, I'm not too sure but i i think that's uh made a big difference to how i feel because then i go to bed not with a head full of all the things that i've just looked yes. at basically for sure yeah there's there's a whole approach to that called the digital sunset right oh. Where, and that's part of it is like no screen so that light excite exciting your brain you know yeah. dimming dimming your lights down thanks stella thanks for joining us thank you <laughs> Um, you know, like turning your lights down to a dimmer setting, like having yeah, dark, blackout, yeah, sure. all this stuff, like that sense of a digital sunset helps to kind of down-regulate the body before going to bed. Yeah. So yeah, like those strategies, some of those elements definitely help. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I think uh, I, I used to have a personal account, like a personal Instagram account, but, mm -hmm. but I actually took that off because I found... <laughs> I was using my business one as a personal one for, for scrolling anyway. And yes. then I was just populating my personal one because I felt like I had to, because otherwise what was the point of having it? So, so I got rid of that and that, and then, so now I just got the one and that helped too. <laughs> nice. So at a high level, you're basically just saying you're just creating space. Like you're just yes, creating, trying creating. to create space. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The other part to that is like, we we're saying yesterday, I think it was, with Misty, it's just saying no, like yeah. just, just legit, just saying no to things and just having the courage to say no to that. So I can say yes to me somewhere else. Yeah, that that's really tricky. I, I find, especially, mm -hmm. I, I don't know about you, Martin, but I find that very difficult, especially when you're in a role where you're um, providing a service to someone and essentially helping them really, uh, yes. if we strip it right back. Um, sure. And so in a work context, I do struggle with that, actually, to say no. Yeah. And, um, and there have been times, certainly over the last couple of years, where I've prioritized the, the self, well, the, the care of others over my own self-care. Of course. Um, yeah. 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 And yeah. It's, um, how did that go for you then? Well, essentially, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure. I got to a point where I was so tired and I just had to... Um, stop for a few weeks and stop doing everything really because I right. I guess it was like burnout or maybe it was burnout um, mm -hmm. 
and I've just been going, 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 going and trying to be doing everything to the best of my ability. So then I, I was just, just giving out so much and then, and then I was just too tired to do anything. <laughs> Right, and that's that's the thing, right? And then you say no, that you could have said no earlier. Yes. <laughs> and had some energy in that no to do what you really wanted to do instead of like sitting in the dark for five days or whatever yeah. you end up doing, right? Sitting there, you're just flipping channels mindlessly because you have no energy exactly. left to do anything. Like that's- Yeah, exactly. Um, like I, I, I'm, for me, for this year, there's some things that are going on with me. Like I'm, I'm running for city council this year. This is a campaign oh, wow. that starts like, later down this year, but I've already decided I'm going to say no to a lot of things. And I had to kind of yeah. even wrap my head around that mm. speaking, you know, speaking engagements, some opportunities to do some travel, some certain things that I'm, I'm intentionally creating space from now so that I can do that well later. Um, but at the same time, you have to like, it, it, it almost, it's tough to say no to those things. Cause like we're helping people, we're warm, fuzzy people. Right. So we want to yeah. like, always help people. So you don't want to, deprive someone of your help but it's not the best use of your time or or you know capacity right exactly and i really like um i i, I like what i can take from what you just said is actually what's key there is the preparation so the commitment with yourself before you've gone into that stuff to say i'm going to say no so you've created the boundaries whereas i think yes. you know and i, I guess what I could be better at is maybe making those commitments with myself earlier so I don't get into it. And then I'm like, oh, God, what am I going to yeah. do? I said no. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. I mean, that's, I didn't even recognize I was doing that. But I've realized that for, for me that I, it, it's really hard for me to say no in the moment. Yeah. So with anything in life, right? I mean, like, if you say at the beginning of the month, I'm not having candy this month then when someone at work offers you a candy, it's easy to say no. Like, hey, I said, you know, for the month of February, I'm not touching that, right? It's easier to do that than right in the moment. Like, I'm kind of hungry, sure. It doesn't really matter anyways. You go into your rationale. So I, I think that that sort of thing is the same for me. Like, if I, if I set that out as this is my no, then when the opportunities come to say yes, if it's not in line with it, then it's easier to decline, right? Interesting. Just reading uh, Phil's comments here. Um, the same thing makes uh, makes us good with our client is a thing that hinders us in our own self care. That's true. We always we're quite the hypocrite with that sometimes. Uh, I love the analogy of putting your oxygen mask on first. Like that's one of my favorite sayings um, because you know we we have to do that. Oh. Yeah. Actually, I can't hear you. Can. Uh, in the chat, can you put a thumbs up if you can hear me? Like, Karen, uh, I can't hear you actually. Hmm. Check. You you gonna log out? Okay. Okay, so you hear me? So, um, Karen's gonna move back in here. Try this again. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, so it says that they can hear me, but they can't hear you. No. Okay, so maybe uh, wait for a type of sub. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. So you guys can hear me though, right? So it sounds like it's on her end. That's the thing. I hope you love like authentic, like this is real, um, real talk. Unplugged. 
Um, yeah, this is a good converse- conversation. I still have to ask her how she found Pilates. That's really my next question. The put your oxygen mask on first comment too, Phil. Um, I did a post on that a long time ago, and it's quite simply for those who who don't aren't familiar with the concept. Uh, on an airplane, they, you know when you're sitting on a plane and they're about to take off, they do that whole safety procedure talk. And one of the things that they mentioned is that in the event that we need oxygen, put your oxygen mask on first and then put on the child next to you. So there's a sense of as much as this, it seems important to help the person next to you, taking care of yourself first is going to enable that both of you survive. Um, so that analogy comes into our self-care, our boundaries, our lives as well. Put your oxygen mask on first and then take care of those around you. So such a good analogies i hope that the sound works here bringing carrie ann back on yes no oh man um can you log on oh wait i hear you you there hey I heard it for a second. Oh, back! Can you hear me? Yes, what happened? Yay! I don't know, I didn't do anything. I just, it just started again. <laughs> All right, that's perfect then. How strange. <laughs> I've no mm. idea what you said. <laughs> oh, okay, um, uh, it wasn't, just watch the replay. <laughs> I, can't remember oh, okay. I, said I really can't remember what I said either. Um, but what I was going to ask, though, was we started talking about, like, saying no and boundaries and all those different things. Um, and I was going to ask you how you found Pilates, because if you were in the corporate world and then you're implied. So obviously, at some point, you said no to your job to be where you are right now. So, like, how did that happen? How did so, you find Pilates um, first? Well, I was working. So I worked as an economist before. And um, I didn't really love what I what I was doing. I sort of I wasn't passionate about it, and uh, I was sort of avidly searching for other options for low, for quite some time. I started a master's in psychology. I did all these different things, um, mm-hmm. and then I had all these aches and pains. And I was working at the time at a at an um, economic regulator, and I and I went off to a Pilates class in my lunch break. And I, I just, oh, I really, yeah, and I really liked it. And the, the studio owner, do you mind if I just let my dog in? Because she's scratching the door. She's <laughs> desperate to get in. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, come on then. Um, the, studio, the studio owner was running a course. She was working with Fletcher Pilates. Okay. Uh, and she was running a course. So, so I decided... She played to my ego a little bit. She told me I was really good at it. I wasn't. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and, you knew um, you weren't, but you just played along. Yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm really good. I'm going to do this. And so, so, I, so I quit my job and um, started the course. And actually, when I started working with people, with bodies, so doing case studies and so on, I realized that actually I knew lots of, intuitively knew quite a lot about movement and why people might might move in a different a certain way and um I, and i just had this like sort of ability to be able to figure stuff out about change changing movement and stuff like that waffling yeah. a bit here and so i was like oh my goodness and i put it i'll tell you what i put it down to two things so when i was at school i did economics and maths and all that stuff and i went to uni and did that but what i really loved was theatre studies. So I did it at my A-level theatre studies and I loved it. Okay. And the thing that I really loved about theatre studies was, um, was watching people and uh, writing about characters and about uh, how they move and uh, their personalities and so on like this. And I liked writing plays. So I think that influenced my ability to intuitively look at people and understand bodies mm, in that way. Yes. And the other thing that I did in my sedentary days was I used to sit on a bench at lunchtime, eating my lunch every single day, watching people walk by. So I was collecting information about how they walked. And um, 
and, and putting it together, I suppose, at a subconscious level, so that when yes. people were in front of me, I thought, ah, I bet you used to sit like this when you were a child, didn't you? And they'd be like, yeah, yeah. I did. How do you know that? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I just do. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and then the rest is history. <laughs> right. So you discovered your superpowers, what you're saying, basically. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> And I still get to perform a bit too. <laughs> yes. yes. It's so funny because, yeah, your, your posts are so theatrical in that way. And that's so funny. That makes sense now. <laughs> there totally you go. Because yeah. I think at this, I love it at the start of my workshops when I say, yeah, I was an economist for 10 years and I see, sometimes I can see people's reactions like, like, you know, I, and in my head I'm thinking, they think this is going to be really boring. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wait till I start tap dancing. Ah, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, this, I, I love hearing that. Like, there's, there's such a cool, like, on a higher level, like, these core conversations, I think this is really the reason why I do these, because you hear, like, the story behind, like, the woman behind the brand, right? So, like, this economist who did theater, who did this, and it's like, oh, that makes sense now. Like, you know, and then you get a sense of, like, okay, what you're going to experience. And the other part to that question, too, is you did this class, you loved it. What about it did you love? What was it that drew you back into the studio? Because I think that that's the question for every new teacher and even for <laughs> experienced teachers like myself. It's like, what, what is it about that, that first time experience that pulls people back into the studio and even pulls them into thinking, I want to do this for a career? Like, that's pretty powerful when you get people on that path. Yeah, gosh, that's a really good question. I never really thought about that. Do you know what? It's um, it's, it's a little, I suppose it's slightly different um, in, in terms of how I ended up getting there as a career. And I think I got to a point in my job, my previous job, where I was just so unhappy and I just didn't want to be doing it anymore. And I just wanted to leave. And I liked doing Pilates and it, and it sounds... I guess it sounds a bit, well, you know, I was in a position where I could just leave my job and do this yeah. training. And yeah. in my head, on a conscious level, I wasn't really intending to teach. I was seeing this as an opportunity to have the space to figure out what it was I was going to do. And then it was oh, when I did yes. the teaching, when I taught people, I realized, oh my goodness, this is what Absolutely. I am meant to do. So. Yes. I think maybe, I get you. yeah, so um, it's, it was the right thing to do, but it was a bit of a gamble. <laughs> of course. <There's, laughs> no, like, no, I hear you on that, though. So it was like, so you, you're jumping out, and it, like, I, my, the very first Pilates class I did, it wasn't for the intent of teaching, too. It was more just to understand what was happening in my own body. Yeah, and it, and it wasn't until years later that I took classes where, where I'm now like, okay, I'm going to use this. I'm going to leverage this against my personal training experience yeah. and have a new skill set and blah, 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 blah. And the story goes on. Yes. But that first one was just my own self-interest, my own self-discovery. Yeah. So I, I hear you on that. Um, and I really actually, I started doing Pilates before that time. Sorry, I'm just giving the dog a stroke down. <laughs> um, <laughs> I started when I had my daughter I did some postnatal pilates with a great friend of mine she's got a page on here called centered mums I think is her hash okay. is her handle hashtag it's not a hashtag it's a handle no, it um is. grace is her name and I really just loved you know us us because I what I was really interested in and then maybe that's my analytical brain um mm -hmm. is like understanding the interdependencies between movements and why you might do this to impact another part of your body. So thinking about yes. it like that. And so I was always really interested in it, in that, in the analytical stuff. She's coming up to say hi now. Hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, and so, and, and so, oh, I've lost where we were going. <laughs> <laughs> I've got lost saying, So you did, you, you did plies before then, prenatal and yes. that self-discovery piece. Yeah, okay, so I did it, and, and then I really liked it, I enjoyed it, and then I went back when I was doing, when I was working at the studio near work, and then I worked quite, quite closely um, during my training program with a teacher called Sarah Woodhouse, who's um, one of the Fletcher Pilates, what do you call them again? Like elder well, type thing? 
like the board type people. Okay. <laughs> like the, I've forgotten the name of the, the special word. But anyway, yeah. um, so and Just she's the amazing and she's yeah. got a real like analytical brain. So she, I could understand her language yes. and I understood the way she communicated. And then that was it for me. I was like, oh, I get this now. And yeah, and, and, and yeah. Fascinating. It's, it's, isn't it, I think that like for me and for those who are watching, I'm sure too, like everyone connects with people in different ways, right? So with my background in like counseling and, yeah. and therapy and like a real relational perspective, I look at the relational side of connecting with people where someone may look at the analytical side or someone's more at like, uh, um, like more data-based or fact-based and like what, like how much, how much pressure is there when you're using the springs when you're on the reformer and how does that relate yeah. to it? Like, I mean, like people ask different questions of the work yeah and I, think, and I think that that's amazing that we can just celebrate how our brains work and how the work connects with us definitely and i think then that goes to who you attract as clients as well because that's you attract exactly, the people yeah. who understand the way that you communicate and right. so and and that's that's really amazing um because that means there's people for everybody because <laughs> yes. we're all slightly different and slightly different and um, vibes and stuff there. Uh, and I know you've had Jenna on here as well, and Jenna and, Jenna and Julie, they're two of my really good friends. Um, okay, cool. And, yeah, and um, yeah. and I and they're both amazing teachers, and I, I love them. That's all I'm saying about that, actually. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> they're great people. Um, and yeah, and it's so funny, like, the, the other side to that is the whole social media thing, which bothers me sometimes when we get caught up in the whole <laughs> comparison thing. And then we, yeah. we we rob the world of who we are because we're trying to be somebody else, right? So, um, so yeah, so being you and just in your analytical mind or your relational mind or whatever it is you are, like just unapologetically do that. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's your part to play in this whole thing, right? I think so. And I, I, going to your social media point, I totally agree with you. And I think that I was listening while I was opening the door for the dog. <laughs> <laughs> and, You're a um, wonderful multitasker. I, guess you do this, I don't right? do this when I'm teaching, by the way. It's just because okay. she's going to scratch that door down. So my husband must be in a meeting downstairs. Um, <laughs> so, um, so in terms of social media, I think what it, it's quite. So there are lots of re there's lots and lots and lots of really great movement stuff out there. There are lots of videos that you can follow along to, and people um, because of the amount of time that you've got and the way that uh, Instagram and uh, TikTok. I don't have TikTok, but I guess I, know, I think I know about that. And um, how like they're limited really to a minute or whatever, and then, and right. people seem to so people are signing up to learning stuff in a minute. So it makes it really difficult to show who you are as a teacher I think and because yes. because you know you could do you could I made a reel the other day where I just did a few moves and it was a minute and you know it's just like blank going from one to the next and I thought yeah, yeah this is fine but I'm not really communicating uh, I'm not telling people how you do this I'm not you know all the things yeah. that I think I like about the way that I teach I wasn't doing that and right. so yeah I mean so I think social media, it's kind of, it's quite hard to know how to navigate it and to keep your own voice, I suppose, which is why it's amazing what you do, because you're doing that every day. Trying. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's, it's, yeah, I was on a podcast yesterday with Saran Spring and, and uh, we're, we're talking about that very thing that like, it, that sounds hard to do this every single day, but much like you when you're doing the thing that you love, when you're kind of in that lane, it's not as hard as it seems yeah. for me. Like, I mean, for you to do that might be difficult. And for me to do what you're doing may be difficult. But for me to do that is, well, no, like I, I get so much energy out of these conversations or whether if I'm just by myself and random people pop into the, the chat, it's fantastic. Like, I love it. So. Yeah. I think it's really cool that you do that. I was um I was tempted to jump in the other day. I thought, oh no, I'll wait till next I week. Saw but that. it's yep, just yep. so amazing, and it's like it's a real, it's a really great thing to do because you just don't know what's going to happen, and and it just I think it's amazing. <laughs> well, thank you. Yep. <laughs> it hasn't gone horribly bad. I mean, like oh, that's oh, good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. No, it's been good. Um. So now, when does the book actually launch? And what's going to happen with it? Do you have like workshops, appearances, like how are you actually, like what's the next part of this? So um, it's going to be 
it's available for pre-order on Amazon now, but it's going to okay. be launched in the US, um, in the UK and other places. Uh, I think Canada included. I need to ask my publicist about that bit. Um, <laughs> some things don't, some, <laughs> I'm not very good at that stuff. Um, anyway, 8th of March, 8th of March. And, 8th of March. Uh, 8th of March is a Tuesday yeah. and um, yeah. and so on that day I'm going to um, try to do I've kept my diary quite free and I'm going to do a few lives throughout the day so I'm going to push oh, myself fine. out of my comfort zone so I'm going to do an in uh, like a um, a Q&A with the publishing company Watkins that, that I'm working okay. with and they're going to collect questions from their their team and then i'll yes. answer them there and then i'm going to do some uh, maybe some live um yeah international women's day it is i know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um i'm going to do some lives and i'm hoping that some people will join me you should come and join me because that sure. would be really nice um, yeah, message me after all, definitely. yeah cool yeah. i will i will yeah. um i would really love for people to just come in and say hi because um, and then i've got um, I've had, I'm doing quite a lot of like um, press interviews at the moment. So I had a big thing in the Telegraph, which is a daily here, um, okay. uh, and some other ones, some magazines and stuff. So I'm hoping there'll be a bit more of that. Then I I'm going to have a, a, a book event in person in, in London, oh, which is very exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, um, yeah, so that's good. And I guess there'll be some stuff with, some bis uh, but that's what I know so far. <laughs> <laughs> How um, it, we're almost done in this fifteen minutes. That went so fast. Um, I know. <laughs> but at the same time, like, how is that stepping out of your comfort zone? Like, you do these crazy, like you're saying, like you're already out there in your social media, and you're just like wild, and you're informative, and you're doing all these things. You're writing a book. Like, how is that outside of your comfort zone? Doing these lives. Um. Well, I think. Well, it's all out of my comfort zone, really. Um, you know, having a book out there for the whole... It, well, it's going to be out there, and I can't take it back. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, feels, it feels really exciting. And if I'm honest with you, Martin, people ask me every day, are you really excited? And the answer is no. I'm really scared, actually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I, I... Like, I'm sort of just going through the day. It's like not actually sitting with that feeling and... Which I need to do because <laughs> I don't want to get to a point where I'm like, ah! Yeah, <laughs> so, true. Yeah, um, I, but I do find it scary uh, because it is exposing. I and, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, it, and, and that's not just at a book level. This applies to all of us and every, anything that we do where we put ourselves out there. If you think pre lockdown, none of us were really getting on so, like, in the same way that we are now and talking yeah. to you know, to the world and putting our moves out there and for all yes. to see, all to um, have a say on and everything. And we've normalized yes. that now, which is great, but it's also, it also is worth just giving yourself a pat on the back and saying, oh my goodness, two, previous me would never have done that. <laughs> True, wow, so good. That's such a good point. Oh man, <laughs> I just wanna like, yeah, I just want to like leave that last comment just out there that yeah. we do need that pat on the back for being brave to be in this space and to do this because we can be judged. We can you get unsolicited input and feedback and opinions. <laughs> and yeah, but we do it anyway. Because I know, we I, and I've had quite a few funny ones, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, but we do it for people, right? Like it is, yeah. in some, it is inspiring someone and that fuels me more than the fear of someone's opinion of how I do it. So exactly. yes, as Phil said, being vulnerable is always scary. So, um, but you do it anyways. Phil's got lots of good stuff to say. I've been liking his comments. Well, yes, yeah, so he's a pretty good guy. Is he your big brother <laughs> or your younger brother? He is 18 months younger. So. Oh, okay, okay. I've yeah, got a younger yeah. sister. She's four years younger. And actually, okay. it's, it's, she's not watching because she's on holiday, but I'm very proud of her. She's just been made the CEO of Macmillan Cancer Charity in Jersey. So I'm very, very proud wow. of her. I might cry. Look, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, dear. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. This is so thank fun. You. I'm so glad that you know we got a chance to to chat and all the best with your book and message me after. I'd love to join you on that live and, and cheer you on every way I can. So that would be amazing. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for having me. I really, really appreciate it. It's an honor oh, to be so on fun. your 
uh, be part of your cool conversation. So thank you oh, very much. <laughs> my pleasure. All right. Thank you. And thank you to everyone. Thank you, Phil. Um, thank, thank you, you Phil. <laughs> Thanks for everyone who joined us today. Really appreciate y'all. Okay. Take care. Bye. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>